We grow about 75% of the food that we as a family eat here on our homestead. And obviously the main portion of that is gonna be like the beef, chicken, milk, eggs, vegetables, and some fruit that we grow. And that's what the main part of what keeps us out of the grocery store. But there are some other things that we grow and make that helps with that as well. And we wanna go over those today because we don't talk about those quite as much as the other stuff. So we wanna give you some ideas for some stuff that you can do as well to keep your family out of the grocery store. We're gonna start off here by talking about the things we do for breakfast instead of buying like frozen waffles cereal and milk instant oatmeal and things like that we buy a huge bag of organic oatmeal in bulk we also make things like sourdough pancakes and waffles and this morning that's what we're gonna be doing we're gonna be making waffles with these awesome cast iron griddles First of all, the recipe that I use for these waffles is off of Farmhouse on Boone sourdough waffles, so you can go check that out. It's a really, really simple recipe. You just use sourdough starter for the base of the pancakes, and then you add your eggs and oil into that, so it makes it super easy. We keep a whole bunch of bulk spelt flour in our basement. We'll get to our bulk food things later, but that is what I use to make these pancakes along with eggs from our chickens. I used to buy cereal from the grocery store just every now and then I would keep healthy brands of cereal which honestly the healthy brands are also questionable but it was just so expensive and the kids would sit down and eat a five dollar box of cereal just in one sitting I just have decided no more cereal we just make things here at home <laughs> yeah don't overfill them <laughs> so I really don't love using cooking spray for these things but I find that when you try to use butter, it just like runs out and gets makes this cloud of smoke. And so I get a high quality cooking oil that's expeller pressed olive oil and not much is gonna get on there and I call this good. We have two different brands and this brand is definitely, definitely better quality than this other small one back here, but they both work. You can come in now for waffles. <gasps> Oh, sorry. There's a snake and it's a real snake on my chair. But it's dead. Why is it there? Who put that snake there? Real gentle, real careful. <laughs> This here is apple mint, which is our all-time favorite remedy for colds and flus. It's maybe kind of like a spearmint, but it doesn't have as much coolness to it, I guess you could say, as peppermint does, and so the children really like it. It's just a little bit more subtle, I guess you could say. We also really like to drink this, like just as a nice iced garden tea. And I also make a really awesome ginger ale with fresh mint. This here is chocolate mint. So this is more like if you're really congested, that's mostly what I use this tea for. I don't use this as much for like a nice iced tea in the summertime. It's just not quite as mild. I make our own tortillas, pizza crust, bread. I can use my sourdough starter. I don't have to get yeast. Sourdough is actually super easy. I was so intimidated with it for a really long time. This sourdough bread recipe just uses four ingredients. It's water, flour, and salt. That's only three ingredients. Water, flour, salt, that's crazy. It doesn't even have oil in it and it's amazing. I use a mixture of bread flour and then spelt flour from our bulk buckets in the basement, which we'll show you. The reason I use a little bit of bread flour is just to really help the dough stick together and hold together. You can absolutely do it without, but I found that our children really like it better if it's softer and not quite as solid. I get the bread flour that is unbleached and non-GMO, and I only do about a third, just a couple cups of this in two big loaves of bread. This rough dough will need to set for 25 minutes before I add the salt and start the stretching process. So while we wait for that, I am going to go out to the garden and show you the next thing that we do to keep out of the grocery store. This year, quick hack, this one's free, I put tomato cages on my pepper plants. That way they won't fall over when they get loaded down. 
Here is thyme. This is what I want to dry today. I try to dry as many of my herbs as I can. I dry parsley, basil, thyme, and then all of our herbal teas. We use thyme for everything. It's especially good on steaks with butter and salt and pepper. Here's my basil plant. It's still looking a little bit small. It's going to grow and be like this massive bush but actually when you clip it, it makes so that the plant bushes out. So don't feel like you're hurting your plant by pruning them down. They'll just come back all the happier. We're back in from the garden now. I'm going to salt and stretch this bread for the first time, and then I'm gonna show you where our drying rack is for all of our herbs and teas. I like to wash my herbs and teas. Sometimes if they're very, very clean, I won't even bother washing them. And another thing is I don't actually love to submerge them in water. I just like to spray them off a little bit just to make sure there's no like spiders or dirt or anything on them. I've been getting some feedback from people that their herbs are tasteless. And the people who say that their herbs, their dried herbs end up being tasteless are the ones that use like heat. They'll like dry them in a dehydrator or something and that's why I don't use a dehydrator. I like to just air dry them on a rack in my basement. I have to empty my drying rack before I can refill it again. This here is the apple mint that I dried from a few weeks ago. Cody made this homemade drying rack out of extra screens from the job that he works. It has totally changed my drying herbs and tea game. So especially if your herbs are a little bit wet, you just wanna spread them out nicely. Some people will uh, tie their herbs into a bunch and hang them like from the ceiling or something, which is totally fine. But if you do that, you wanna make sure that there's no dampness in them at all or they will mold and you don't wanna drink moldy tea, I promise. And this right here is stinging nettle. You can look up what all this stuff is good for. I'm not even gonna try to say all the things that it's good for. I just love to add it to teas for the added nutrients, the added benefits that it gives. I forage this from our pasture and you wanna be really careful when handling it because it will sting so bad. I've gotten a lot of questions about how long it takes herbs and teas to dry on a drying rack like this. And the answer is, I mean, it's gonna just vary on the temperature in your house. It's gonna vary on whether or not you have a dehumidifier going. We have a dehumidifier down here in our basement and so my tea dries out really well within a week or two. I often actually leave it down here even longer than that. I basically leave it on the drying racks until the next round of herbs is ready to go on it. The drying time is also gonna vary with what kind of herb you're drying. Some of them are like hard and woody. Some of them are more soft and thin. After these herbs are dried, I like to strip the leaves off of the woody stems. Just do whatever you think is best. The stems won't affect the flavor or anything like that. Now, if you're using things like thyme or basil and seasonings like that, it isn't nice to bite into a woody stem on your steak or chicken. Herbs and teas have so many healthy properties, so many vitamins and minerals, and I feel like a lot of the processing of commercial herbs and teas take a lot of the properties out of them. Another tea that I would really like to try next year is red raspberry leaf tea. That's something that I drank while I was pregnant along with nettle and oat straw. I looked it up today though, and you're supposed to harvest red raspberry leaves before the bushes blossom. Otherwise, the internet said the leaves will be more bitter. And no, I am not pregnant. <laughs> I just like to drink it for overall health. I like putting the dried leaves into my Ninja Blender and pulsing it just a few times so that it's a finer consistency to put in these little tea strainer cup things or a tea ball or anything like that. This is something that we're just starting to do on our homestead because back in the day I decided to try it and I did it while Michelle was pregnant and it made her very sick. We are going to render tallow but we did find a way to do it that doesn't make her sick and what we do is we will cut it up into these little chunks, put it in a crock pot 
put the crock pot outside so the smell is not in the house. Another way to do it would be to put it through a meat grinder to grind it up like hamburger. That would also work, but this isn't too bad. I don't do a lot of the cooking in here. Michelle does most of that, and what she uses the tallow for is pretty much anything that she would use like coconut oil for. So she's been buying coconut oil for a long time because that is a pretty healthy fat, but it is really expensive. And the thing about a lot of the other seed oils that are out there is those are so unhealthy for you. There is even research coming out that is showing that they might even be more unhealthy than sugar. Basically in the past, these companies had byproducts from some of the farming they were doing, like cotton farming and stuff. And so they started wanting to market the oils to be used for cooking and it kind of demonized the animal fats. And animal fats are actually really good for you. We use a lot of butter on our homestead and now we're starting to use a lot of tallow. We had already been considering doing this for a while, but what really kind of inspired us to get started is I've got a friend that had some real bad problems with heartburn and he decided to go off of seed oils and start using tallow. They had a butcher shop and so he had it readily available. He did that and his heartburn problems completely went away. This would really stink to do without a chef's knife. This knife right here has made a huge difference for Michelle in the kitchen. And this is one place where it really shines I bought this for her as a Christmas present. I'll drop a link for it in the description below so you can find it too because you want to make your wife happy, get her one of these. So as for how long this is going to be in the crock pot, you basically want to have it in there until everything is liquid except for the cracklings that are left. And what you want to do to keep it as odorless as possible is to do it low and slow. In case you don't know what this is, and I don't think I really mentioned it, this is beef suet. And that is the fatty stuff like around the kidneys on the beef that we raised. So even if you don't raise your own beef, you could probably get some of this suet from a local butcher shop. Just go and contact your local butcher shop and see if they've got any, because a lot of people that get their beef butchered don't get the suet. And so if they know that you want it, they can save it from a beef that they process. This bread has been in the fridge overnight. Its last rise happens in the fridge. I have two Dutch ovens that have been in the oven for about 30 minutes at 400 degrees. You want to put your bread into a preheated Dutch oven. This is called a bread lame, and I like to just cut right down the center of my bread. We just got back from the beach, so I'm baking this bread for us for a snack tonight. One thing that we eat a lot for snacks is sourdough bread with peanut butter and homemade jam. I'm gonna bake this bread for 20 minutes with the lid on, and then another 15 minutes with the lid off. The lid on helps the steam to build up inside the Dutch oven, and it makes the bread go poof. And then when you take the lid off, it browns nicely. dripping out the bottom. Cody went to work this morning, so I am finishing up this tallow that he started. I'm gonna turn this to high until it's good and going, and then I'll turn it down to low and just let it slowly melt over the course of the day. The tallow is still out cooking on the porch. Cottage cheese is one thing that I have still been buying every now and then at the grocery store. I don't nearly buy it every time I go shopping, but it's one of those things that like I've just been skeptical as to whether or not homemade cottage cheese is gonna taste the same as store-bought. The silly thing is, is that we love homemade things. We don't mind tastes that are different, but for some reason, cottage cheese is one of those things that we just haven't tried. For this video, I decided I'm going to learn to make cottage cheese. We're gonna see if this is one more way that we can cut out a purchase at the grocery store. What I'm afraid of is that the cottage cheese is gonna be more the texture of farmer's cheese with cream on it, and that does not sound good to me. I want it to be the nice soft curd that normal cottage cheeses, so we'll see. But really, what does she mean by normal? 
This only needs to get to 80 degrees, so I guess it's gonna be a raw cheese. While this cottage cheese is heating up, or while this milk that's supposed to turn into cottage cheese is heating up, I am going to make butter. I have a gallon of cream here that I need to get in the freezer in the form of butter. Butter is a huge, huge thing that keeps me out of the grocery store. We go through a lot of butter. We believe that butter is healthy, a healthy fat, especially raw homemade butter. I try to make a year's worth of butter every spring slash early summer. In my freezer, I have like bags and bags and bags, pounds and pounds of butter. So I'm having a bit of an issue trusting this recipe from Google. And so I'm kind of fact checking it by this recipe. I didn't have quite all of the ingredients in this recipe for cottage cheese. And so I found one online that had the ingredients that I actually have on hand. This book is Home Cheese Making by Ricky Carroll, and it has helped me so much. Most of the recipes of cheese that I make, like my ricotta and all of those are out of this book. I will tell Cody to drop a link for this book in the description below. Cody, put it in the description below. With rennet, you wanna be very precise because the um, strength of your curd, like how, um, how tough your curd is, I guess you could say, is very important in the texture of the cheese that you want. I'm gonna put a tight lid on this and set it to the back of the stove and it's supposed to sit there for about four hours or until the curd has started to set and is silken like tofu is what it said. And then we're gonna cut the curd and go from there. how this tallow is doing. So it's looking pretty good. It still has quite a ways to go before it's done. But we are waiting for the tallow to finish cooking on the porch and to see how this cottage cheese turns out, we are gonna go out to the garden and I will talk to you about the next thing we do to stay out of the grocery store. Condiments are one thing that we don't like to buy at the grocery store. Number one, like barbecue sauce and ketchup and things like that really give Cody heartburn. So with all of my tomatoes, I make marinara, barbecue sauce, ketchup, tomato juice, chunk tomatoes, salsa, all those things. So I like I literally have never, probably I haven't bought any kind of tomato product for six years maybe, I don't know. The other thing that we make is zucchini relish. We really like that on hamburgers and hot dogs and stuff. Even my kids really like it. So here are my zucchini plants and I'm going to be picking zucchini to make all sorts of zucchini relish sometime this week. Something literally killed my zucchini plant just today. It must be like a squash vine borer or something. Ah! This plant was literally like this high, not exaggerating. I kind of feel like I'm waddling like a duck. Here we are down in our basement and these are my canning shelves. All of my condiments are kept down here on our shelving that Cody made for me last year. I also make homemade mayonnaise with like avocado oil and then fresh eggs from our chickens and a stick blender. I will leave as many of these recipes for you as I can in an ebook that Cody will link in the description. So in all honesty, I'm not very much of a recipe kind of girl. For a lot of my like ketchup and barbecue and things like that, I have kind of a basic recipe and then I just do a lot of taste testing and I get it to where I want it. Um, but I don't want to give you guys a recipe like that. So this summer, I'm going to try to nail down some of my recipes so that I can actually put them in written form and give them to you guys. Something that I know will taste really good for you guys. And growing and preserving a lot of food doesn't really do you any good if you don't have a good place to store it. So while we're down here in the basement, let me show you what we've got going on down here to store all of that food. Like Michelle said, I did build these shelves for her just last year. Got tired of making do with just rickety old shelves and stuff. So I made two by 12 shelves that was like the right width 
and it was really simple because it's just like a flat board with a little front and legs and it's done. Right now is the time of year when everything's kind of empty so we're getting ready to fill stuff back up. And down here underneath the shelves is all of our buckets of bulk food stuff. We get stuff like spelt flour, black beans, oatmeal, brown rice. We also get raw sugar and Redmond salt. It's a lot cheaper to get food in bulk like that, and it makes so we're not running to the stores often for some of the basic necessities. We also have two chest freezers down here where we keep all of our beef and chicken, broccoli, raspberries, strawberries, the jams that Michelle makes, cause she doesn't like to can jam. We also have our cold cellar right here where we keep a lot of our root vegetables in. Before we go in there and I show you that, I wanted to talk about something real quick. We've gotten a lot of comments saying that we should be using the freeze dryer, vacuum sealer, and stuff like that to make our food last way longer. And first of all, for us, uh, the money thing has been an issue. We haven't been able to afford equipment like that, and I know a lot of you can't either. And I guess for me, at this point, I haven't seen the importance of having my food last way longer than a year or two years. I mean, the stuff we've got in our canning jars and our buckets and our freezer, that'll last a couple years if we need it to. And if we're talking about an EMP or a zombie apocalypse or something like that, I really don't think a freeze dryer is gonna do a whole lot of good in that kind of situation. As a side note, we do have a generator as backup if the power does go out for a few days. We just cleaned out our cold cellar, so there's not a lot going on in here, but we do keep our potatoes, sweet potatoes, onions, and garlic in here. And I'm hoping to sometime put a door in the middle right there so that we can have a more damp room and a more dry room so that we can start keeping carrots and some stuff like that in here. For now, the carrots are stored in bags in our extra refrigerator down here in the basement. Okay, so it is really dark out here, but the tallow is finally done. I'm gonna set these two jars in the fridge and amazingly enough, they will turn to a pure white. All right, let's see how this cottage cheese has set up. So it's definitely pulling away from the sides and it's definitely gelled. So we're gonna cut this into cubes. This is called cutting the curd. We're gonna let this sit for five minutes and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna turn the heat on very low and we're gonna slowly and gently heat this back up to 111 degrees. I don't know about this. Oh, I'm done. It's not working. Um, I mean, it looks kind of like cottage cheese. Cody oh, thinks it. Really. Cody thinks it looks like scrambled eggs. We're supposed to put cream on this, and the recipe asked for buttermilk, like from the store, like the thick cultured buttermilk. I don't have any. I'm thinking of putting a little bit of yogurt in it. <laughs> We'll put it in the fridge and we'll see how it tastes by tomorrow. You're supposed to chill it before you eat it. So tomorrow will be the true test because I have found that cheeses taste a lot different after they're chilled than when they're still warm. The curds are definitely squeaky, which is good. It's not like the, the more dry curd like the farmer's cheese would be. Last night, Michelle was feeling very bad about her cottage cheese. She was pretty sure that it didn't turn out. I thought it looked pretty good. Tastes a little bit, thought it tastes pretty good but it was warm and so it did taste a little odd. It's been in the fridge all night. We'll see how it tastes now. And here is the tallow that she made. So this is like a solid white chunk now. And then when she wants to cook, she scoop a little bit out of here, just like you would with coconut oil or something. So it turns out really cool. So after the cottage cheese was made, Michelle added some yogurt. It felt like it needed just a little bit of tang to it. And then she also, and that was yogurt that she made. And then she also did add some milk to it to give it more of that, I don't know, soupy texture? Cause it was more just like chunky. I'm going to try this. And one of my favorite ways to have cottage cheese is with raspberry jam. The raspberry jam that Michelle makes from the raspberries in our garden. So first of all, a bite without the raspberry jam. Like I think that's really, really close. And it's not like something homemade has to taste store-bought, but it's what I'm used to. And I really love cottage cheese. And that is really, really good. It's a little bit different and obviously you can see like it's a lot more yellow so that kind of like throws you off a little bit but that's just from the guernsey milk so now with the raspberry jam that's good this was only some of the ways that we use the food that we grow here on our homestead we did a video a little while back where we only ate food that we grew here on our homestead for 48 hours that was a lot of fun that video is right here you can click or tap on it to watch it next
because we're more than farmers. The main portion of that is gonna be the beef, pork, pork. Pork. <laughs> when you are making cheese with rennet, you want, ah! It came out of here instead of here. <laughs>